of people are here at the front desk. My lovely wife, Marilyn, the dentist and TMJ specialist who uh, works with me. Um, my daughter, Lexi, who's a, a data analyst and um, blockchain entrepreneur um, who, uh, who also works with us. Um, I'm a, uh, an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, my life story in brief, I think, is in there someplace, but I'm a native of Chicago suburbs. Um, got a, a bachelor's degree at Princeton and an MD from Johns Hopkins. And, Internship at the U of Chicago and a residency at Rush and a fellowship at the Harvard Medical School and the Massachusetts General Hospital. I've been practicing in Chicago for 35 years, 27 of them as assistant professor of orthopedics at Rush. I stepped down from that six years ago to devote more of my time to regenerative medicine. Um, I am based in Chicago, but I come down to um, Naples twice a month in season, um, once every five or six weeks in the summer. Um, and I timeshare right now in the office and have been for about five years on uh, uh, Benita Beach Road um, and do regenerative medicine work. I don't do surgery down here um, uh, and, uh, and, and see patients here uh, regularly. We've seen people tomorrow. So um, what, what are adult mesenchymal stem cells? So those are what we inject. And I will tell you, as with a lot of things that seem confusing, the stem cell world really isn't. If you, if you kind of you know the signal and noise. So I'm gonna tell you the signal, not the noise. Um, um, so these are partially differentiated cells from your body that are active in tissue repair. They help tissue heal themselves. They modulate the immune system and decrease inflammation. They are not fetal or embryonic. Um, so uh, what, there, there are two words that float around in the space, autologous and allogeneic. What do these mean? Autologous, um, auto self, autologous cells are cells that are from you. So we take your stem cells and treat you with them. Allogeneic are cells that come from somebody else. We use both, and different ones of them seem better for different treatments. And this is a rapidly evolving field. We are at the absolute cutting edge of this field worldwide and modify what we do fairly regularly based on other data that we produce or that others produce. So uses, I've got a laundry list here, um, and I'll just go over briefly now and we'll come back to it. So what disorders are stem cell injections used to treat? Partial use. Arthri for arthritic joints is an alternative to joint replacement. Neurologic diseases such as MS and Parkinson's disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, diabetes, non-healing leg and foot ulcers, spinal cord injury with paralysis and post-stroke syndrome, psoriasis and other skin disorders, pulmonary fibrosis and COPD, erectile dysfunction, Peyronie's disease and interstitial cystitis, Lyme disease, chronic fatigue, anti-aging, scleroderma, any autoimmune or inflammatory disorder, basically. So you're thinking, gee, is that just like every disorder you could think of? Uh, no, these are disorders that have actual literature showing clinical efficacy in humans, usually a lot more e efficacy um, in animals. So how effective are stem cells for these disorders? It's variable for each one. We have a huge database for each of these, and for some of them, very effective, very well shown, for others, less well shown. Um, how many treatments um, How many treatments are needed? Uh, it depends. Um, in general, treatments will last for years. In some cases, treatment must be re repeated more often. Uh, regarding uh, joint replacement surgery, most of the patients that we see, most of them that we treat, and not all of them even need stem cells, even with platelet-rich plasma, which we do a lot of down here. Most of the patients that we see who have been told they need joint replacements wind up not needing them. For how long? Well, we do, we do two-year follow-up studies, but we've got data out to nine years for some of, some of this. And we've got a very good idea of which patients need them and which don't. Um, how long does it take for treatment to work? So there's a, there's, a, there's a differentiation between stem cell treatment we're allowed to do in the U.S. and treatment we do offshore, we'll talk about it. The treatment we do in the U.S., it can take weeks or months. The treatment that we do, we can concentrate stem cells. It usually works almost instantly and in days. Um, so are there any diseases where stem cells have not been shown to work so far? Cancer. Right now, there aren't good stem cell treatments for cancer, but I will tell you, we're talking to a brilliant doctor from Israel, 600 publications, who has some some, some, some great things that he is doing with recurrent cancer that is not otherwise treated. Uh, genetic diseases, by and large, are not candidates so far, such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, Huntington's chorea, 
cystic fibrosis. But I will tell you, there are techniques involving gene editing, so we are probably going to be able to treat these pretty soon as well. Risks. Are there risks or complications of the septimal stem cell injections? So let me tell you, the way the dialogue always goes, and I was talking to some people at our last talk, is you talk to your physician, or you talk to somebody, and say, well, what about stem cells? And they say, well, you know, the data really isn't in, we don't know. Well, there are some risks. But here's the thing. Stem cell treatment is arguably the safest treatment paradigm that exists in medicine. So when you think about it, if you have a problem, you see a physician, how are you treated? Well, the overwhelming majority of treatments involve pharmaceutical drugs. Pharmaceutical drugs are chemicals that are introduced de novo. And these have to be tested. And they have to be tested for short and intermediate and long-term benefit. And as you probably know if you read the paper, there are things that get through short-term trials just fine. And five and 10 years later, Pepsid, you know, causes spontaneous fractures of pain were associated with cancer. Pepsid's been out there forever, right? So you just, you just don't know. But stem cells, in many cases, they're your own cells. So you can't have a reaction to your own tissue. Or if they're taken from somebody else, it's the same kind of tissue. And stem cells do not have what are called HLA antigens, like blood products. They're not subject to rejection. Actually, embryonic stem cells are, but nobody uses embryonic stem cells. So these are cells that are using what has been evolved over millions, billions of years of evolution to help heal you. So I will tell you more specifically as far as the science. Um, as you see, we've got a wonderful foundation with some incredibly smart people working for us. And we do high-level research and publish it in good journals. So we did a systematic review. We looked up every paper. Dr. Romschlag, you might have seen there, did a lot of the heavy lifting on this. <clears throat> every paper published in the PubMed indexed peer-reviewed literature, stem cells for arthritis. There were six different kinds of treatments. So um, autologous is actually from you. Um, so how many serious adverse events were there? I mean, there were some people that had soreness at the injection site or itching or whatever for a little while. But how many serious adverse events were there? Zero, none, ever, okay? We are doing a more ambitious study of all of the serious adverse events from mesenchymal stem cells, adult stem cells, and anybody ever. We are researching LexisNexis legal basis, trying to find people that were doing weird stuff maybe didn't make it in the literature. So the, the only adverse events that have been seen, with a couple exceptions, involve egregious use. Unfortunately, several here in Florida, Florida and California are kind of meccas for this sort of thing. Even then, not many, but people that were using them in a, in a bizarre and wrong fashion, in many cases not even physicians. And there aren't even that many of those, single digits, basically. So egregious use. We just found, as we're finishing up this paper, uh, Dr. Romschlag found a case report from China of a couple instances of DVT, blood clots. The, pe the people did fine. This is only in China. We can't find it anyplace else after you know, tens of thousands more than that of, uh, of abuse. So, you know, when people say, well, we don't really know, is there some risks? Um, I mean, nobody has seen it. Nobody has seen it. And there's no reason to think you're going to see it. The thing that people worried about early on was tumors because stem cells can have uncontrolled growth, right? And that probably is a risk with embryonic stem cells. But embryonic stem cells were used briefly in the 90s. They were the first ones discovered. Nobody's using them now. There are disadvantages to using them. These stem cells that we're talking about, adult mesenchymal stem cells, some people don't even think they're stem cells, actually, that they, because they don't grow all that well. They work by the immunomodulation and other means. But nobody has ever seen a tumor from a mesenchymal stem cell, ever. There was one recent report from Portugal, which was just cited to me. Nine years after treatment, somebody, seven years after treatment, somebody got a benign tumor in the cervical spine and they were injected. But these were not stem cells. These were somebody who should have known better, who took mu mu mucosal, nasal mucosal cells and injected them into the spine. Don't ask me why. Um, so, so tumors, nobody's seen it. Serious infections, nobody's seen them. In fact, they're used to fight infection. I mean, you could get an infection from an injection. It could happen, but nobody's seen that either. So what people have seen, lightheadedness, uh, transient fever, um, uh, you know, that kind of thing. But this is the safest treatment pretty much that, that exists. Um, and it's just important to realize this because the dialogue gets obfuscated by people that make blanket statements without knowing the science. We find the science, we publish so, so that we can prove it and know it. And by the way, you know, there's, if you go into our on our website, our publication list is out there. You can Google me and PubMed and, and see some of the things that we're, um, uh, that, that we're producing. 
Um, some other treatments, the questions that I get, can I be treated with stem cells if I am on blood thinners or other medicines? Yes. We treat people, one of the things we do is do a lipoaspiration, take fat, digest it with an enzyme, and inject it right back. We do that on people that are fully coumadinized, fully blood thin, um, no problems uh, during or after. If you have surgery, you should stop your blood thinners for surgery. That is said to engender minimal risk. Well, I'm not interested in minimal risk, I'm interested in no risk. So we tell people, by all means, stay on your blood thinners, no problem. Um, other medications, stem cells interfere with just about nothing medication wise. And in fact, we're kind of pharmacophobic, as it were. You know, drugs are great, but we get people off of drugs. We get people off of all non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We try to get them off of autoimmune drugs um, if we can. So how do autologous mesentable stem cells, or any stem cells, work? They work by something primarily called immunomodulation. So what happens is most chronic diseases, and even acute diseases, occur because of an inflammatory response that causes unwanted side effects, or your body attacks itself, autoimmune disorders. So for example, rheumatoid arthritis, your body attacks your joints. Um, MS, your body attacks the uh, myelin sheath that coats nerves, and the nerves don't work as well. Now, so what stem cells do is they modulate their response. And this can get wonky, and I won't get into it exactly. There's a thing called M1 and M2. These are phases that your macrophages work in. In one phase, they attack, in another phase, they heal. So stem cells induce them toward the healing phase. Um, um, so they work by, with two separate types of substances that your body makes. The one type are called growth factors, and they have long names, like transforming growth factor beta, or VEGF, uh, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. These are what your body uses to help heal you. No pharmaceutical does this. Nobody's been able to reproduce it. The other thing is, so they take the tissue that you've got that damage, that damage and make it healthier. The other thing are anti-inflammatory cytokines. More substances of long names. Many of them part of the interleukin family. And so one of the most uh, prominent is interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, which blocks interleukin-1. Interleukin-1 causes inflammation. Interleukin-1 RA blocks it. <clears throat> now, cortisone blocks but cortisone kills cartilage cells. Cortisone kills tendon cells. I never inject cortisone into a joint or a tendon, and none of you should ever get a cortisone injection into a joint or tendon. Now, I'm aware that most of my colleagues inject it, and years ago, I did it a little, and this is no criticism of them. You, you know, Naples has outstanding orthopedic surgeons. Almost everybody I know in our field is a wonderful doctor. So why do they do it? Because if they're not working in biologics, they don't have anything else, and maybe they're not quite aware of how bad it is. In your folder, there's a little brochure about me, there's this FAQ, there's a magazine with my picture. The back cover of that magazine is an article uh, that was printed in the late press about a year ago that describes some uh, research studies that showed that cortisone shots do far worse things than we used to think, causing avascular necrosis and other problems, and cause you to get a joint replacement quicker and with a greater likelihood than if you didn't get it. So in other words, if you go to somebody and you get a cortisone shot, you are increasing the likelihood that it's going to result in a joint replacement. So cortisone quells inflammation, but it does bad things. Cytokines from stem cells quell inflammation, and they help you heal. They do nothing bad. This is how nature quells inflammation. And that's, that's why we use these. Now let me say something else. There are autoimmune disorders, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, where you attack your gut, all these terrible diseases. And everybody knows that they're autoimmune disorders. Well, it turns out osteoarthritis kind of is too. So, you know, people come in with bone on bone arthritis. And they say, well, I've got bone on bone, so I need a joint replacement, right? Well, not necessarily. And let me tell you a little secret. And nobody knows the secret except orthopedic surgeons. And the secret is this. There are millions of people running around with bone-on-bone -bone joints with no pain at all. They're probably not running marathons, but I need people that are playing tennis and have no pain. What happens is that when people get bone-on-bone, -bone, as they lose cartilage, in some of those people, it engenders an inflammatory response. It's not a florid response like rheumatoid arthritis, but that's what it is. And the body starts to get inflamed and get sore, right? But it doesn't have to be that way. And what we do with 
Modern arthritis we've had great success and published a great paper, and I'll talk about this a little, a little later, with the way they'll let us do stem cells in this country. We've had great results avoiding joint replacements. With bone on bone, the way they let us do it here doesn't work as well, but the way we're able to do stem cell treatment offshore, we can do more advanced things, it works, it works very well there for bone on bone. But the point is, um, all of these things involve the body in one way or another uh, getting inflamed or scarring um, occurring. So the corollary is, well, do stem cells grow new tissue? So people come into me from all over, and they've heard about the work we do, and they say, they don't want a joint replacement, can you help? And I say, yeah, you know, can't guarantee it, but probably so. It says, great, boy, I really want to grow some new cartilage. And I have to say, well, you know, we don't grow new cartilage. I'd like it if we do, and someday maybe we'll grow, but right now we don't. What we do is we take a bone, a joint with arthritis that's inflamed, and we make it non-inflamed, non-painful, more functional. Now, stem cells will one day be able to grow just about everything. And we're getting there a little bit. There's a very smart doctor at Wake Forest who has put in, I think, something like 20 bladders, urologist, in people grown from stem cells. He's growing the bladders. Amazing stuff. And eventually, we're going to be able to do that with all kinds of tissue. Uh, but we're not there yet. And it's important to know this, because one thing about the stem cell space is it's very easy to kind of give the patient what they want and tell them things that maybe aren't entirely accurate, whether because you don't know, I don't know, but I want you guys to know the truth. So we're not growing new tissue, but we're making the tissue that's there healthier and we're, and we're decreasing um, inflammation. So some technical points. Uh, who does the injections in our clinic of joints, for example? Most of my colleagues have mid-level practitioners doing it. Fine, I don't, I like to do my own. I think there's a bit of an art to it. So I do all my own injections. Do I use ultrasound? We do what we need to. Do we use sedation or medications? If we're taking fat or bone marrow or injecting things, do we use sedation? No, we don't. We don't let people use it. Because, you see, the stem cell treatments are so safe and generally so painless that we've had no problems and I don't worry about it. But the minute you start giving people drugs, you're gonna get drug reactions and whatnot. So, so we don't use drugs, people, people don't need them. Are the injections painful? No, they're not. They, you know, you feel it, they're a little uncomfortable, but you often, you know, people saying, wow, is it over? I'm surprised. So let me get into the nitty gritty a little bit about, I've been talking about stem cells a little bit in the abstract. So let me get a little more concrete with what's done. And again, we're on the cutting edge of this treatment on a worldwide basis. There isn't really anything that's being done that we don't know about. So, um, there are four types of stem cell treatments that we're doing now. We, um, I was interested in doing this some years ago, uh, became aware that, it would dip, that we couldn't do it in the US, kind of got tired of the US uh, not approving it, you know, they still haven't except for small clinical trials. So, there was tremendous demand for stem cell treatment and people go offshore. Uh, the biggest stem cell treatment in our clinic, uh, clinic in our hemisphere is in Panama, a very large one in Colombia, several in Mexico, the Caymans, um, elsewhere. So Nassau passed uh, legislation to authorize stem cell treatment. So you have to go to them, apply, get a license, and do it. So we did, and we did this three or four years ago. The state of the art was something called stromal vascular fraction. Funny name, I don't know why it's called that, but it is, SVF. So what this entails is we do a lipo aspiration. So a person comes in, you lie down to the table, we numb it up, we like a liposuction. It takes an hour and a quarter, hour and a half, doesn't hurt, local, no sedation. Um, it's tedious, you kind of got to lie there, a little boring. We take that tissue and we digest it with an enzyme and treat it. This gets rid of the fat, gets rid of the fibrous tissue, preserves the stem cells and related immunomodulatory cells, and then we inject it back. That whole process takes about three hours. So stromal vascular fraction. And I'll explain a little later, there are pluses and minuses um, to that. So as the field has evolved, though, there is more and more evidence that culturing cells can work better. So we do cultured autologous adipose stem cells. So let me back up a little bit. The stem cell treatments that you can do in the United States are, I don't want to say primitive, but let's just say they're not state of the art. So I can stick a needle into, into the back, the iliac bone, and get some mesenchymal stem cells from bone marrow aspirin. How many? 30, 40, maybe 70 or 80,000 stem cells. I can take some fat, they won't let me get rid of the debris here, but I can get fat and get nine or 10 cc's that I can inject into a knee and get three or 400,000 stem cells. With stromal vascular fraction, 
I can get 20 or 30 million immune cells. And by culturing stem cells, I can get 100 million or 200 million stem cells. And these treatments just work better, especially for autoimmune disorders. So, cultured autologous adipose designed from stem cells. We take a small specimen of fat, send it to a tissue bank, they isolate it, culture it, and then six weeks later, we inject it into you. Um, cultured autologous bone marrow. We take a small bone marrow specimen, send it to a tissue bank, they isolate the cells, expand them, and send them to you. These, by the way, are top flight tissue banks that we deal with. They're doing FDA clinical trials. Everything is cultured assiduously. They check DNA. Extremely safe. And the most recent thing is cultured umbilical cells. So what are these? This cultured allogeneic adult umbilical cord derived stem cells. How's that for you? So women after term pregnancies, cesarean sections, donate their umbilical cords. The, the, the adult mesenchymal stem cells, these are not fetal, these are adult cells, are isolated, cultured just as these other cells are. But they're younger, even though they're not fetal, they're younger, and they're metabolically more active. And there's increasing evidence that they work better, and we're starting to use them um, as well. They are allogeneic, but they don't have HLA antigens, so they are not rejected. They don't engender a rejection response. They're basically like your cells, except uh, from, you know, from somebody else. So these are the four things that we do. Stromal vascular bridge. Take your fat, uh, treat it, inject it back in one second. Cultured autologous adipose, take some fat, send it off to be cultured, inject it six weeks later. Or whenever you want, you can freeze these things long term. And by the way, you can then have multiple injections from that same batch of stem cells. Cultured autologous bone marrow, like fat except bone marrow, and then cultured allogeneic umbilical cord uh, derived. These are all mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, and um, The other things that are out there to be used, if you're getting things done in the US, and I'll talk a little more about this later, is simply taking bone marrow aspirin, maybe centrifuge it and inject it, or taking fat. Um, the FDA is very restrictive. The FDA, by the way, uh, didn't use to regulate human tissue. Uh, they started from the 90s because they said they were worried about contamination. In 2005, they finalized regulation. And unfortunately, they've, they've imposed drug standards onto human tissue in an area where the usual drug company studies that are often hundreds of millions of dollars to bring a drug to market, um, but drug companies can pay for it because they get patents. Um, but nobody had that kind of money in the stem cell space because pharma is really not in the middle of it. And there's nothing against pharma there. You know, they do what they do to try to help people. That's great. It's just unfortunate that the stem cell space is a bit of an orphan. Um, and that the U.S. has regulated it uh, um, to the extent that they have. Um, so uh, I can take, and we published this paper with mild arthritis, as I mentioned, and we had good success. We take bone marrow aspirin, we take a small amount of fat, uh, we take PRP, plasma, but we're injecting all kinds of things that I just assume not inject. And they don't, they're not toxic, but they induce an intense inflammatory response. So when we do this, people with knees, we do it there, we do it every joint, get very inflamed for five days a week. They don't come down completely for usually a month, maybe more. When you inject pure stem cells, there's no inflammatory response. These are anti-inflammatory things. When I first started going down to NASA, and I'll talk about that in a minute, I did an 80-year-old gentleman who had a bad hip, retired engineer from Wisconsin. Um, we injected him at one o'clock or so in the afternoon, and he went out to dinner that night, and he, he called the next day, we said, oh, so how are you doing? He said, I have no pain. No pain from that night. He's 10 months out and still has no pain at all and had no inflammation from having done it. So they're pretty remarkable when you're allowed to do them with the state of the art. By the way, taking these cells and getting rid of all the debris with collagenase and injecting them, this has been done for decades. And it, and it was done, and then the FDA decided that it shouldn't be done for no reason that anybody can tell. Now, some people say, well, you know, pharma doesn't like it because stem cells are, are safe and they're effective, and they outcompete drugs in many cases. So is pharma actively lobbying against it? I mean, I don't think so. Um, but the fact is that the people at the FDA are generally people that either used to be in pharma or will be at some point. At least they talk to them, and they're kind of oriented, oriented that way. But the effect has been that there's a tremendous demand for stem cell treatment. And people that they could use it that are suffering that don't need to, in some cases that are dying that don't need to, um, and we can't do it here. Uh, 
Western Europe the same way. Uh, Europe is regulated a little differently. It's country by country. The wealthier countries regulate it like the US does. So the UK, France, uh, Germany, Italy. The less prosperous countries, uh, Portugal, Malta, Serbia, uh, Ireland actually, uh, Greece, and Cyprus um, don't have prohibitions um, uh, against it. Uh, so where do people in Europe vote for stem cell treatment? Generally through Asia. Tremendous amount of work being done in China, in Korea, um, and, and elsewhere there, which uh, unfortunately the, the, uh, uh, the Europeans are not allowed to do um, uh, at home. So, so as I started reading more about stem cells and getting involved and how safe it was, I thought for sure that the FDA, and the FDA was holding hearings in 2017, I thought for sure they were going to start allowing us to do this. But they haven't, and I don't think they're going to. Um, and that's why I decided to go to NASA. Why? Because there's technology that's exceedingly safe, good evidence of efficacy, um, and we're forced to do primitive treatments here, and it just didn't make sense to me. So a lot of trouble to go down there, a lot of expense. We have to charge more than I'd like to charge just because we got to pay the clinic, we got to get work permits, all kinds of stuff. But, um, but, but that's why people go in droves offshore to places like that and um, why we do. Um, Cyprus, um, we looked at the various countries that I mentioned where we could do it. Cyprus was appealing to us for a variety of reasons. It's a very sophisticated island nation. They have the second most college educated uh, population in all of the EU. Uh, they have transportation access to every population center in Europe and the Middle East. Uh, it's a beautiful place people like to go to, uh, and they have an excellent hospital and a good medical infrastructure. Uh, I also am of Greek descent, um, as is my wife. Um, we speak Greek and are comfortable there and, and just found great people to work with and we needed a place there. So we are getting going there as soon as the COVID um, quarantine issue uh, dies down, we'll be treating uh, people there. Um, so, so the question that arises, well, why do patients or why should patients come to us for treatment? So um, here's why. In the United States, we have great medical centers, you know, Mayo, my alma mater, Hopkins, and the Mass General, and Stanford, and they do great studies. Um, unfortunately, though, in many cases, they're using outdated, what I consider outdated technology. There was a study done at a famous hospital that I won't mention in New York of, um, of discs. They wanted to inject stem cells for discs, so they injected bone marrow aspirin. Well, you know, half a cc of um, fluid is all you get in there, and you can't get many stem cells. And predictably, they had a little help, but it wasn't very good. So if you use cultured stem cells, you can get probably 50 million stem cells with much, you know, with much better treatment. So they did a great study of a technique that I don't think was probably very likely to work. Now, in some cases, they're doing great studies of more advanced treatments. So they, they do great studies, but what they're studying, and some of it is because of the FDA, you have to get something called an IND or an ID. You have to apply to the FDA. And these are crazy experiments. And they take a long time to get. And then you're locked into a protocol for a long time. So, so people go offshore to the places that I mentioned. And you can get advanced treatment. But here's the problem. If you're going to Colombia or Mexico, there are great doctors there, no question. But you know, maybe it's a little harder to know. If you're going to Mayo, you know, you're pretty comfortable, it's a good place, right? But if you're going elsewhere, like how do you how do you actually know? Um, people like American doctors all over the world, right? Well, these are not American doctors, not to say they're not good. But the question is, how do you know where to go? So in my case, you know, I have sort of a good academic pedigree. I publish. Um, so people come to me even here because they read about stem cells, and they feel comfortable coming to me kind of for that reason. So my thought was, and the other thing that we do that almost nobody else is what is done here. We follow all our patients. I've done over 4,000 PRP and stem cell treatments. So our stem, our foundation, which I fund mostly privately, um, employs all the people that you saw in that video. So we have people, we call all of our patients, and we keep calling. So we've got eight and nine year follow ups some of our, our PRP people. So we know the results of our treatment. I don't know other places offshore that do. Most of them don't do it hardly at all. Some of them do it very short term. It's very expensive. It's very hard. At universities in the United States, you have to do it if you're going to publish. 
and we do publish it. So people come to us because we do research. Because when we give people data, we give them real data. We don't just say, you know, like we work, we say, look, these are the studies, this is that. So, so we attempt, in a nutshell, to provide, as I said in that video, United States university level rigor to cutting edge treatment. And I, there's other places doing great work, but, but, but that's what we endeavor to do, and that is why people come to us. I believe at least that's why they, um, what they tell me. Um, so if you go offshore, um, how long do you stay? You can come in on a Thursday, get treated on a Friday, and go home on a Saturday. Probably go home the same day if you want to. Um, some people stay for a longer time with medical tourism, not so much now with COVID. Um, uh, what about COVID? You would need a, a test to go there and quarantine issue Cyprus now and Greece, Europe is kind of in a bad state. It's going to be a few months. Uh, Nassau is much better. Um, so the future. What are the future? It is a crazy, exciting field. And you know, people, people ask me, say, is a lot of running around? And it is. And do I like doing it? No, I don't like running around. But you know, this, 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 this field exists, and it can really help people. So I kind of do what I have to do to, to, to do right by. So I've talked to you about injecting mesenchymal stem cells. Well, these are cells that are cultured or come from you and are injected. But you can do more. You can culture stem cells with specific growth factors. You can take mesenchymal stem cells and grow them under hypoxic and other conditions, and you can teach them to make L-DOPA, which is what deficient with Parkinson's. You can teach them to make insulin for diabetes. There was a paper that was just sent to me by our tissue bank in Colorado, which was replaced by their head of the PhD, where they did something in the laboratory where they took components of these stem cells, they have an animal model for ALS, and found that the cells didn't seem to die nearly as much. So you can culture stem cells to do different things. And we are involved. We're involved with a great tissue bank that was in Switzerland that's coming to Cyprus, um, and also these guys in Colorado to do that very thing. Also, stem cells have what are called exosomes. These are vesicles within the cell that have the chemicals that help uh, it work. So there are people now who are promoting exosome treatment, and they're saying it's like stem cells. And these, these people seek me out all the time. I look at their data at great length, and I will tell you there are no clinical studies showing it does anything. I think they probably help, kind of like PRP. It just costs way too much. They are probably also not FDA approved. In fact, we just got a letter from the FDA last week saying you shouldn't be doing this. That's now. But one day, they will. One day, we'll figure out how to take the components from the stem cells so you don't have to inject the stem, stem cells. When will that be? I don't know, you know, five, seven years, hard to know. But the, um, there's amazing things that are happening now, and it's only going to get more amazing going forward. So go back, if you're following along, or if you're not, to page one, and um, this laundry list of disorders for stem cells. Uh, so I, I give these talks every year, have been for a while, and in my experience, people come often because they're interested in knowing about a particular disorder. So. I'm done with the talk um, and am happy to entertain questions about the state of the art for any of these disorders or any other disorders or any other questions that you have. Parkinson's disease is not classically, it's, it's called a neurodegenerative disorder. It's not classically thought of as an autoimmune disorder, something where your body protecting itself. But I will tell you that there are cases with Parkinson's that have responded well to stromal vascular fraction. So when I went to Nassau, they gave me permission, they gave you license to do various things. So I was allowed license initially to do arthritis, but not all of the immune disorders we are now. And I had a gentleman, well-to-do attorney, who had a terrible knee, in one near his bone of bone knee. So we injected his knee, lipoaspiration took fat, digested it, injected his knee, injected it intravenously. So he's also nine, 10 months now, no pain at all in his knee. Um, but he had Parkinson's, disabling Parkinson's, mostly genital urine. So we did this on a Friday, I think, and he, a week later we talked to him, he said three days after we did it, his Parkinson's symptoms entirely went away. And when last I talked to him, it was 10 months later, and, and they are still gone. How long will they be gone? I, I honestly don't know. They, they may last a year, they may last a year and a half, they may last longer, they may need to get it done again. But he was still completely gone. There was a, a brilliant doctor, Stanford-trained plastic surgeon who's been in Nicaragua for decades doing amazing work. 
We treated several people with the same stromal vascular fraction, and he's injected it into the veins in the face, actually, to try to bypass the blood brain barrier, and has had amazing, has had amazing results. I had a patient with what's called essential tremor. It's not Parkinson's, but it has some similarity. Um, same thing, he had a bad knee, we did the knee, we injected IV, and three or four days later, his essential tremor was entirely gone. He was thrilled. So we talked to people periodically. So six months later, it was coming back. And at, I think it's nine months now, something like that, it has come back, not as bad as it was, but it has come back half, maybe a little, a little more than half. So what's the answer there? Does he get a treatment once a year? You know, hard to know. Would more stem cells help the next time? Hard to know. Where we are now, and we do these clinical studies and get data on everybody. And I will tell you that almost nobody does this because it's very expensive. We follow up all of our patients, all 4,000 plus that we've done. I have people that work for my foundation. We have interns that help us, and they call people and find out. I'm working with a tissue bank that has done 8,000 stem cells in Mexico, and I was like, oh my God, what a treasure trove of knowledge. They follow up a little, not much. They're good people, but, but just saying, by doing these studies, we find out how long it works, what works better than other things. So Parkinson's, and we're not exactly sure even why, seems to respond, and there are animal studies also, and other studies with stem cells, seems to respond well, and we're looking to do more of it. Um, so intravenous stromal vascular fraction, intravenous culture umbilical. Um, there's the Dr. Panama doing uh, culture umbilical, and has had good success with it. Um, there's a question of whether it should be injected into the central nervous system. It's called intrathecal in the spine. There's some evidence from MS that that might be helpful. So these are all variables. And we, we treat people, we follow up our results, we compare our notes, and we go forward and advance the field. Um, MS, somebody had asked about MS. MS is a bona fide kind of classic autoimmune disorder. Your body attacks itself. It attacks the myelin sheath, sheath of motor neurons, and your motor function deteriorates over time. And there are benign MS and more aggressive MS, and it can be treated. The thing with MS, RA, all these autoimmune disorders, the drugs are great, great advances. But these drugs, they're not really great for you, you know? I mean, maybe better to take them than not take them, but you see the commercials where they go on for 45 seconds about all the bad things it can do, and they're being honest, that's great. The point is, the stem cells don't have any of these problems, none. They do nothing bad. But they do many of the same things that these drugs do, and they have the potential to do it better. So MS has had this excellent published paper with culture and ability. So, and we're going to be starting to do that. Very good results, one year results. 17 out of 20 patients in this study had, had very good results. There is a doctor, interesting story, he's a Greek. And 25, 30 years ago, he was doing stem cell treatment in Greece. And they said, stem cells, oh my God, you're killing babies, stop. And, you know, he wasn't, but at that point, stem cells were kind of a dirty word. And, and at that time, people were using embryonic. By the way, nobody uses embryonic anymore uh, because we don't need to. They don't work any better than any of the others. And actually, the interesting thing is embryonic cells do have what are called HLA antigens, antigens, so embryonic cells can be rejected. The adult cells that we're using uh, aren't. Anyway, so the University of Hadassah in Israel said to him, come, we'll let you work. And so he did and has done great work there, published a landmark paper in 2010, won this MS award in Stockholm in 2017, Ekrims it's called, the MS Society. And he gets cultured bone marrow, he grows them with growth factors to partially differentiate them, and he injects them intrathecally into the spine or intravenously. And he's documented that he gets better results injected intrathecally by lumbar puncture, which is, you have to know how to do it, but it's, it's spinal tap, it's, but it's uh, safe to do. So we're talking to him, um, Europe has actually gotten, and Israel has gotten more um, repressive for people that were doing good work. So we are trying to bring this tissue bank to Cyprus, and there's also one in Miami, we, we think, where he can do his work. Uh, we're actually sending a patient there. He's also, he was the principal investigator for the, um, the one study out there that had shown some significant efficacy for ALS. And it wasn't great. But 25% of the people that seem to arrest the disorder, 25% have slowed it down, 50% didn't do anything. But that's against other treatments, which are almost completely useless, you know? Um, 
So he was recruited to the Mayo Clinic by another group to be their principal investigator. And they did this trial, didn't really do as much. So, um, but he's having a hard time regulatory-wise where he is, and we're talking to him, and we hope to be able to bring him to Cyprus um, to, to grow cells there. So for whoever asked about ALS, the short answer is almost nothing, except in Dimitrios Karusis, K-A-R-U-S-S-I-S, is the first, he works with two separate companies. Um, and uh, he is basically the only person, at least that I know of, um, I mentioned that a few days ago, there were some exosomes, some other things as well that may give promise for ALS. We're going to start an animal study. We have a patient that's desperate to get treated, and sometimes you can get permission from the FDA for what's called compassionate use of the safe, and I may try it there. That's the state of the art with ALS. It's a horrible disease, but there is, but there is some hope and some, some efficacy space there. Uh, the MS? So the question is, should you get drugs? Should you get drugs or should you get stem cells? So, you know, um, and there's a whole other technique of stem cell treatment which I really haven't even gone into, which we may be starting where you can take stem cells out and immunosuppress a person as though they had cancer and then give them back. And that's been pretty effective for MS and some other disorders. The problem is there's some risk. In some of these trials, some people have died. There were some more recent studies where nobody has died. So there's been efficacy with that with MS. There is efficacy with umbilical stem cells with adipose stem cells, all kinds of them. So, I don't know, I guess if you had mild disease and you're taking drugs, I guess that's okay. But being able to take something that seems to arrest the disease in a completely safe fashion is, is, is very appealing if you don't have to completely mortgage your house to do it.